Hi and welcome to the vlog. I'm getting my tea sorted. I have my notebook. I have really messy notes. I am so looking forward to doing this. <laughs> if I can even read my own handwriting. Hyperthyroidism and perimenopause. This is something I've hinted at in previous vlogs that I want to talk about because I live with an overactive thyroid disorder and I have spent actually a few months now trying to find research and failing miserably. There's no bloody research on it. I am yet to meet with my endocrinologist. I have an appointment in December. I did rush in to have blood tests done fairly recently, so I know that currently my thyroid levels are perfectly normal. Uh, and I'm gonna get into why I rushed to do that. But basically, information about an overactive thyroid and perimenopause and treatment of perimenopause when also living with an overactive thyroid, it's, it's oh God, it's so hard to find. Now, I, I think there are good reasons why there is so little information out there. Uh, first of all, Thyroid disease is significantly more common in women than in men. So, you know, if I may put on my feminist hat for a moment, we know that there's going to be less research on any condition that is more common in women than in men. It's just how it works. Oh my God, it's annoying. But when you look at uh, an overactive thyroid condition, a hyperthyroid condition versus a hypo, an underactive thyroid condition, we are looking at in the UK population, 2% are hypo underactive, and this rises to 5% in the over 60s. So the older you are, the more likely you are to be hypo underactive. And also we are looking at four to 10% of women living with hypothyroidism. So, you know, so much more common in women than in men. If we then look at the percentages of hyper, we are looking at 1.5 to 2% of women. So four to 10% of women are hypo, one and a half to 2% of women are hyper. So it's, it's really, really much less common. Also, the preferred way of treating hyperthyroidism is by removing the thyroid most commonly by radioactive treatment, radioiodine treatment, which kills off the thyroid or parts of the thyroid. Less common but happening is actual surgery to remove it. But effectively, if you live with a long-term overactive thyroid condition, the preferred method is to kill your thyroid, which then leaves you hypo. So to be a woman in her midlife with, an, with a hyperactive thyroid, is really not that common. So hi, that's me. I'm unique, I'm rare, I'm special. I can't find any fucking information about my own situation, right? Love it, love it. So what have I been able to find out and where have I been able to find it? The numbers I quoted are from the NICE website of NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, and they refer to UK. So they might be different for the US, uh, for the rest of Europe, for whatever country you're in. But for the UK, the numbers I quoted are from the NICE guidelines. Um, I had then stumbled over some information in a podcast episode. And it was literally 10 seconds of that of an hour-long podcast episode, 10 seconds were about an overactive thyroid. And I was like, oh my God, that was the first time I found anything. Then I found, actually through the British Thyroid Foundation's website, I found a webinar on menopause there with a little bit of information. But it's so scant, it's so little, because they spent 90% of that webinar talking about hypothyroidism and then 10% about hyper, if even that. If we're looking at perimenopause, uh, the recommended treatment for perimenopause in this country is hormone replacement therapy, HRT. Uh, I am on HRT, so I take oestrogen every day and I take 
uh, progesterone on a, a cyclical basis. So the last two weeks of every four week cycle, I'm also on progesterone. And I've been on this now for just over two months and I'm finding a hugely positive effect in particularly my mental and emotional symptoms of perimenopause. But three weeks in to my HRT treatment, my thyroid symptoms flared up like mad. And it was only over a few days, but for a few days I had palpitations, I had dizzy spells, my thyroid enlarged so I could see it from the outside, which I usually can't. <laughs> Uh, I had tremors, uh, I ha my anxiety skyrocketed obviously because I thought oh my god I've started HRT and, and now it's affecting my thyroid and I'm, I can't have this treatment that is clearly helping me and what's going on with my thyroid and am I about to die. Um, you know, not dramatic at all. And uh, so I called up my endocrinologist clinic, my endocrine doctor was on annual leave but one of her colleagues spoke to me and said right we're getting you straight in come here we'll do the blood tests here and we're going to test your thyroid function your thyroid stimulating hormone we're going to check your liver function your kidney function your blood count we're going to test for diabetes uh, he even wanted to test me for celiac but i think i've done like seven celiac tests now in my life and they all come up negative so i was like don't waste don't waste my blood on that um, but he did all of these other things called me two days later and went everything's normal I was like, why am I having all these symptoms? And he's like, I don't know, but give it a little bit of time. Just, just wait it out and see if it helps. Um, and my symptoms calmed down very quickly. And maybe a large part of my symptoms calming down was the fact that I now knew that my thyroid levels were fine. I mean, I was still going, why the fuck am I having all these symptoms? But um, at least I knew I wasn't at immediate risk of a thyroid storm, which is always nice. Um, and since then, my thyroid has calmed down. I feel euthyroid, which is me, means that my thyroid is balanced and my hormones are where they need to be. Um, and my blood tests have obviously confirmed that I am euthyroid. So um, I can stop panicking about that for now. When I spoke to my GP about it, she said, give it time. And I'm not surprised that you had a little hiccup. Um, because you know you are suddenly really boosting your estrogen levels and your thyroid is going whoa <laughs> because you have estrogen receptors in your thyroid so you have all of these estrogen receptors in your thyroid and um, the binding proteins to which thyroid hormones bind also increase with estrogen so you have that and your thyroid is going to go whoa and then it will hopefully sort itself out. So I'm hoping, I don't know, but I'm hoping that this is the case, that my thyroid basically went, whoa, estrogen, and, and just needed a bit of time to adjust. It was a bit of a change. It came a bit suddenly. Um, and then I'm not gonna have any more problems with this. I am obviously following up with my endocrinologist uh, and doing regular blood tests. I do that anyway to make sure that my thyroid function remains optimal and that my medication doesn't need adjusting. But yeah, it was, it was an interesting effect and I'm curious to find out more. I'm really looking forward to having that appointment in a few months time and have a chance to speak to my endocrinologist about it. Um, I mean, I would, I would love to be involved in any research related to this and I don't know if there's it, it's even any going on. Um, and I don't even know how I'd, how I would find out, but you know I, I must be quite I must be quite a rare person, but I don't think I'm the only one. I really want to find out more, and I'm struggling to find out more. So, what have I found out exactly? I mean, apart from the numbers of women who live with thyroid conditions. So, from the podcast I mentioned, it's called Perimenopause WTF, and I love it. I'm gonna link it because they post that podcast here on YouTube and they also post it on just audio platforms like Spotify and probably Apple Podcasts and what have you, I listen on, on Spotify. Uh, and it is hysterically funny and uh, this woman and her guests have no filters um, and I love it. But in this episode, she's talking to uh, one of the real uh, menopause and perimenopause pioneers and warriors, a, a a doctor called Mary Jane Minkin, who's been working on this her entire professional life, and she's now in her 70s. 
a question came up from one of the listeners about Graves' disease and how that's affected. And the response is that there shouldn't be a huge effect. Shouldn't be. Uh, but make sure you follow your thyroid levels because of this difference in the binding proteins, although she calls them binding globulins, but it's the same thing. Um, I don't actually know really how binding proteins work, so I'm not going to try and explain it. I'm sure there's information out there, so go ahead and have a look. Yeah, so that was literally it. Not a huge effect. Okay. Great. The webinar on the Thyroid Foundation website, and again, I'm going to link it, so go and have a look at it if you're interested. And it takes a bit of concentrating to pick up on the bits to do with hyperthyroidism. They're talking about things like thyroid disease can often be missed in perimenopause and that the symptoms are so overlapping. So I thought that was really interesting and it's something that I've noticed as well, that a lot of my peri symptoms are so similar to my thyroid symptoms that I actually missed for ages that I was perimenopausal and I was just wondering why I felt this way when my thyroid was clearly balanced and well managed with my medication and I just f felt weird. Um, but with an overactive thyroid you get hair loss and hair loss is one of my peri symptoms as well. Uh, sweating, heat intolerance, they come on both. Irritability, no I'm not irritable am I? Don't breathe in my presence. Like, I am so irritable. Um, and, and that is both a symptom of perimenopause and a symptom of hyperthyroidism. Um, it affects your period. They tend to get scanta with, um, with hyperthyroidism. That can happen in perimenopause. Mine have, my cycles have become shorter, but my periods have become heavier. Um, muscle aches occur in both. So... Uh, soft nails, dry and brittle nails occur in bo both. So the, the symptoms are so overlapping and they do go through that in the webinar and I thought that was very interesting. They do say again that HRT is the first line treatment for perimenopause even in women with thyroid disease. There is no indication that you shouldn't. And again I find this so reassuring. I think you know a, a thyroid disease is a hormonal imbalance and perimenopause is a hormonal imbalance and to me it is super important that I treat and manage both of these hormonal imbalances. <laughs> now they are talking about the binding proteins in this webinar but only in conjunction with being hypo. But basically if you live with an underactive thyroid and you medicate with levothyroxine which is the, the standard treatment for that, uh, going on HRT means you need to you it means you may need to adjust your treatment dosage and i i'm i'm guessing wildly here but it would make sense that it works the other way around that because the binding proteins uh that the thyroid hormones bind to will increase with estrogen it makes sense to keep a really close eye on an overactive thyroid as well and adjust dosage as required was there anything else? Uh, yes, there were a couple of things that came up. So Graves' disease was asked in this webinar as well. And again, it was just so little information in the answer. Mostly that it's not clear cut. <laughs> but it was somebody who asked about developing Graves' disease at the same time as perimenopause. Now, I've lived with my disease for... Oh, crumbs, how long? Eileen is 10, and I had my third recurrence just after Eileen was born. I had my second recurrence a couple of years before Eileen was born. Uh, so that would be 12 years ago, and I had my first instance when I still lived in Lucian. Crikey. 15, 16 years I've lived with this. So that would take it down to me being 30, first time I got it feels like I would have been younger but like I didn't get an overactive thyroid in my midlife I got it when I was in my prime <laughs> I feel more in my prime now than than I did then but okay but um developing Graves disease in your midlife and what she answered in that is that they do know that there are changes in how Graves disease no let me backtrack now 
my diagnosis is not Graves' disease. My diagnosis is recurring thyrotoxicosis. Graves' disease is the most common diagnosis of an overactive thyroid. But that is apparently not what I have. Go figure. But this question was about developing Graves' disease in midlife and whether um, changes in reproductive hormones have anything to do with developing Graves' disease. And 80% of developing Graves' disease is uh, genetic, has a genetic component. However, they do know that there, uh, there are changes to how Graves' disease behaves related to reproductive hormones. Um, so it very often improves in pregnancy and it very often flares up postpartum. Um, so when I say that I had my third recurrence after Elin's birth, I had a massive flare up postpartum with Elin. And then I kept medicating through my pregnancy with Alice because they didn't dare take me off it. But um, the correlation between them is not clear cut. It, again, if I look at me having this hiccup of my thyroid symptoms three weeks into my HRT treatment, you know, I, I can see that, again, you know, yeah, maybe there is a correlation between reproductive hormones and thyroid levels and that, that they interact in some way. But exactly how they interact, I couldn't say I'm a medical expert and I'm just talking about how I felt. Uh, and clearly, my hormone levels didn't change. So, eh. In that webinar, they're also talking about supplements like iodine and soy. I think that's quite interesting because not everybody wants to go on HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Not everybody can go on hormone replacement therapy. Um, and, and actually, I mean, even though it is the first line recommended treatment, only 14% of women, 14, 1, 4, go on HRT treatment at the moment. And even with that, there's a shortage of hormones. You know, we are a minority, we women who choose to use hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and a lot of women are looking for more alternative options. And soy is a very common one. Uh, uh, it's, it's often spoken about as an option. Um, and I think, you know, if you, if you do not have thyroid disease, then I think soy is definitely something you can try. But personally, and again, this is anecdotal, um, but personally, I believe that soy has an impact on my thyroid. Uh, and I believe this because I went through a period in my life when I used a lot of soy products. Um, I was trying to work out why I had such bad digestion and food issues, and I, I thought I had a lot of food intolerances and I tried to cut out practically everything out of my diet in order to improve how I was feeling. Uh, and so, and, and this was a long time ago, so soy was really the only non-dairy alternative available. So I had so much soy in my diet, soy milk, soy cheese, soy yogurt, soy this, soy that. Um, and I was still reacting to things, and so I stopped all the soy as well, I cut that out of my diet as well. And uh, that was my second recurrence of my thyroid. Um, it exploded a week after I stopped taking soy products and it just went Wah! Um, and so I believe that me ingesting that amount of soy products was keeping my thyroid levels down and therefore I personally will not use soy supplementation to treat my perimenopause symptoms because I am worried that it will have a massive impact on my thyroid. Again, there is no science behind this. It is anecdotal and it's personal, okay? So don't quote, by all means quote me on it, but you know, I'm not an endocrinologist. I'm not the medical expert here. So if you have questions about soy and you have a thyroid disorder, speak to your endocrinologist, pretty please. Uh, I mentioned that the most common treatment for an overactive thyroid is to kill the thyroid off or remove it. And I haven't had that done. And it's something that eventually I may have to. This, this is an occasion where I absolutely love and adore my endocrinologist because I really do feel that she provides individualized care. I think she's very, very good. And she's very honest with me that that is what they would prefer to do. I have recurring thyrotoxicosis. If we stop treating my thyroid, it will go haywire again and again and again. And 
that is dangerous. It leads to heart failure, it leads to osteoporosis, it leads to severe weight loss and malnutrition. Um, you know, it's, it's dangerous having an uncontrolled overactive thyroid. Um, and the preferred treatment is to stop the thyroid functioning and that leaves the person with an underactive thyroid for the rest of their life because they don't have a thyroid that functions anymore or a thyroid at all. Um, and so I would be treated for uh, hypothyroidism instead, having this done. Now, the preferred way of removing the thyroid is to kill it off using radio iodine treatment, radioactive iodine treatment, radiotherapy, and that would make me radioactive for a period of time, probably no more than two weeks, possibly only one week. Um, and this is why we're not doing it. Because the last time we discussed it, Alice was newborn and Eileen was very young. And basically I have young children and one of whom depends on complete one-to-one -one care at all times. She's like, your lifestyle doesn't really support this at the moment. And I'm like, no, it does not. Thank you very much. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, there are side effects to either. There are side effects of long-term treatment for an overactive thyroid. There are side effects for long-term treatment of an underactive thyroid. And I'm going to be on lifelong treatment regardless of what we do. Whether we do radiotherapy or not, I'm going to be on lifelong treatment for my thyroid. So whilst I'm remaining balanced on the medication I'm currently on, whilst I am not displaying any of the dangerous side effects of it, there is no reason to change it. Now, I don't know if perimenopause and menopause will affect my thyroid and change this, uh, whether the HRT will affect my thyroid and change this. And again, I'm so looking forward to speaking to my endocrinologist about all of this. And I will take her advice on it. And if she says, you know what, I, it, it's really pointing towards radiotherapy is your best option, then of course I will do it. Um, and I think particularly now, yeah, my ex-husband probably will not love the idea of me not being able to have the kids at all for two weeks. I love it. No, I don't love it, but like it can be done. They are old enough now and we have enough care and support and help in place that it can be done. Um, and so I'm not adverse to it, but I also kind of feel why, why, why fix what ain't broke? Or why, why change the way you're fixing what's broken? <laughs> I don't know. Do you know? You're my emotional support kitty today, aren't you? No, I'm just a snuggle bum. Okay. In short, finding information about perimenopause and hormone replacement therapy in cases of living with an overactive thyroid has been nigh on impossible. I don't know yet. <laughs> I, I still feel like I don't have any answers. I think the only answer I have is there's no reason to believe HRT is contraindicated. Okay. All right. Great. Because we haven't come across it yet. I, I take a bit of heart from it because it means that it hasn't been glaringly obvious that people living with an overactive thyroid and receiving treatment for an overactive thyroid respond really badly to hormone replacement therapy. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's just not enough information about it. And uh, that tells me there is no research going on about it. And I get that it's rare. I do. I understand that it's rare, but I just wish there was more I could find out. So if any of you know any source for me to find out information about this, then please point it my way. Um, if any of you yourself is living with an overactive thyroid and going through perimenopause or think you may be going through perimenopause and you have found this to be kind of helpful to hear that somebody else is in the same place, then say hi and let me know how you're getting on. And in general, if you are treating or not treating perimenopause and just wanna share how you're feeling or what you're experiencing or what you've learned along the way, again, please go ahead and do so. And thank you so much for 
watching my vlog, following along with my ramblings. I really appreciate it so much. Have a beautiful day. See you soon. Bye.